Well, welcome to this uh, presentation on the, the uh, landmark uh, health issues that are recent and out of our day. Uh, back after our um, book proved positive, in fact, someone mentioned that afterwards, uh, one of the reasons uh, after um, Dr. Scharfenberg and I had spent some time together, we, um, uh, we came out with, or I came out with the book uh, Proof Positive, and Scharfenberg uh, was one of the primary commentators on the back of the book, and it, and it really helped it sell. What's that? Oh, yes, the, the forward, the forward in the book, yeah. <laughs> he says uh, he says it's a good forward. You should read it now. <laughs> Years later, uh, that was back in the '90s. So yeah, that's been been a while, uh, and we're just updating it now. We're um, we have it out. I think this fall, um, but uh, we're we'll have all updated studies and actually some new chapters and things. But after that book came out. I was asked to speak in a place in East Texas, and it was called, since the book was called Proof Positive, it was called the Proof Positive Health Summit. And uh, there was a uh, community lady that uh, came that everyone noticed because she didn't get out much, but she had just turned 100. And uh, she was actually taking notes on how she could have better health uh, <laughs> at 100. And uh, the word got out, and the news media realized this could be a news media event. And so um, uh, the news media, uh, news anchor woman herself came out afterwards, and uh, there was a lunchtime uh, meal. And so she bought a little cake with 100 candles on it. <laughs> and uh, the lady <laughs> blew the candles out, and then this news anchor put a microphone under her chin and said, Tell us, ma'am, what's special about being 100? And right away she said, no peer pressure. <laughs> <laughs> and I was uh, thinking today, you know, when, when you're 100 and you have no peer pressure, you can say whatever you want to say. <laughs> you can say what's on your heart. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Scharfenberg, we're looking forward to hearing about these landmark um, uh, health uh, aspects and also um, uh, I might be interviewing you uh, near the end and then we can open it up for okay. some questions. Do you, do you want this computer hooked up or you want to just go I, off your I notes? Won't need the computer. You won't need the computer. Okay, I'll just unplug this and get rid of it. Yeah, the computer is all up in his brain. <laughs> You're exactly right. Oh, yeah. And it keeps expanding. <laughs> Now, ever since I was a little boy, I was a strong believer in spirit of prophecy. I've studied that all my life. Probably know more about it than anybody else. <laughs> and I know more about it because my wife read it all. And if there's something new that I didn't know, she would tell me. <laughs> now, let me, as a medical student, before I was a medical student, here's the handout. Oh, they don't have the handout. I want them to have the handouts. We got them in the morning. This morning? You got them? The one on drugs? No, no, no. This is another one. Yeah, let's. Anyway, I saw these strong statements in the spirit of prophecy. And I believe the spirit of prophecy. But how do I handle these statements? When you understand physiology in its truest sense, your drug bills will be very much smaller. And finally, you will cease to deal out drugs at all. Amen. Drug medications should never have been introduced into our institution. Amen. They, physicians, resort to drugs when greater skill and knowledge would teach them the more excellent way. Sanitariums were to reform the medical practice of physicians. It is the Lord's purpose that his method of healing without drugs should be brought into prominence in every large city through our medical institutions. I said, how can I do that? I believe it was in the spirit of prophecy. How can I do this? Uh, 
I'm going to show you the Lord was so kind to us in our ignorance. He showed us how to do it. That's the big breakthrough. Now, you've heard of a fellow by the name of Pasteur. Because of his flash studies, we learned the germ theory. A real breakthrough in hell. Fleming came along, discovered penicillin. Another big breakthrough. Now, the other big breakthrough I want to talk about just happened. And nobody has heard of it. Cardiovascular disease is best prevented by lifestyle. Amen. We can decrease heart attacks, first stroke, 80% with proper lifestyle. Avoiding seven risk factors. Okay. Diabetes, we can decrease the chance of getting it 88% with the same lifestyle. This is what the World Health Organization says. This is what the American Heart Association says. This is what the European Cardiology Society says. It's not just me. All the big shots are saying this. Now, my son's a doctor. He goes to all these programs where they give you updates. He's never heard of this, that I gave it to him, this material. <laughs> they don't see. The doctors, many of them, have not accepted this thought. So the world, uh, let me give, get this here. I, I give you here in the first sheet here, maybe it's the back of the first sheet, uh, the, some statements from the uh, scientific literature on that. I'd give the date maybe 2010, we learned about that. The risk of type 2 diabetes was lowered by 88% by these same health behaviors. Now, what are the seven risk factors? Tobacco, alcohol, inactivity, overweight, too much meat and sugar. And then they added two others high blood pressure and high cholesterol. But if you do the first five, you don't so often have to worry about the high blood pressure and cholesterol, okay? The people rebelled against that recommendation on meat. They rebelled. So the Heart Association changed it. it says we need more fruits and vegetables. They mean less meat. But then they added another one. They said, don't get more than 5 to 6% of your calories from saturated fat. Yeah. Let me give you a secret. That means vegetarian diet. <laughs> but they haven't said any bad words. They didn't talk about vegetarian or meat. Just cut your saturated fat down. You go to a dietitian and say, how do I do this? And she gives you a diet that's vegetarian. <laughs> Which is quite exciting. I can go into a public school and teach the Adventist health message with those points. That is the Adventist health message. And we can do it. Okay? So I have some statements for your file on that. Now, tobacco. We've known that since about uh, 1964 when the Surgeon Journal came out with tobacco is not good. Everybody knows that. Although in Eastern Europe, they haven't heard of it. It's terrible. It's terrible what's going on there. They haven't heard of it. Uh, they're smoking a lot. Uh, alcohol. There's one fellow who just did a study in 195 countries, Max Griswold, up at the University of Washington, Seattle. Now, just behind him is Bill Gates' house. He overlooks the campus, and his name's on many buildings on the campus. But Bill Gates funded this study. Now, this man, Max Griswold, he was a social drinker. And the thing that he was interested in, how much is safe to drink? 
How much is he? He found the answer. Zero. <laughs> He's just like an Adventist now in this thinking on alcohol. It's zero. Up to that time, we've been saying a man, man can have two drinks a week and a woman one drink. No longer. It's zero. Because any amount of alcohol increases your risk of dying. Any amount. And now that's pretty good. Uh, so it's tobacco, alcohol, that's two of them. Next one, inactivity. You need to exercise inactivity. Now, the next sheet tells you a lot of stuff about inactivity. For every hour you exercise, you will live three hours longer. It's pretty good, isn't it? That's part of the Harvard alumni study. It was two hours, so they've changed it. Now it's three. Okay? I've outlived my two older brothers, one 13 years, the other 16. And I'm not going to die right away, so it's, every year it's going up another, another year. You see? And now in Hawaii, they checked the people who walked two miles a day or more compared to one mile a day or less. They cut their death rate in half. That's not too bad. You could take the time to do that. Okay? You don't have to worry about your heart rate or anything like that. You know, just work to a sweat. That'll take care of it. Weight loss depends more on the food intake than exercise does. You have to exercise too many miles to help. So you got to do something with the food. But I'll tell you why you need the exercise too. But your whole social life changes. You start getting friends who are thinner. <laughs> but being lean has only an advantage if you're exercising. Two lean men, both normal weight and everything. The one exercises, the other doesn't. The one who exercises has only half the risk of dying. So being lean is not going to do you any good unless you're lean because you exercise. Okay? And the obese woman who exercises outlives the normal weight woman who doesn't exercise. I had a lady who was really helping me a lot. She was a good artistic person. She did all my... Uh, my uh, drawings for my uh, my uh, programs, and she was so good. She did this for a living. She made money on doing these graphics things. She was heavy. She was big, big, big. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to her one day, "You know, I have to talk to you about your weight." Her face dropped. I said, you see, I'm a preventive medicine doctor. I have to talk to you about your weight. I said, do you want the good news first or the bad news? She said, give me the bad news first. I said, you should know that overweight is going to increase your dying from almost any disease we know. <laughs> but let me quickly get to the good news. The good news is if you exercise every day, you will live longer than the normal weight woman who doesn't exercise. Now that's exciting news. See? Oh, good, good, I exercise. What kind of exercise do you do? I go horseback riding. <laughs> now I know the horse exercises. <laughs> But, but she was excited about this horseback riding. If you do exercise real well every day, you will live longer than the normal weight woman who doesn't exercise. Two lean people, one exercise, the other doesn't. Only thing that helps you in being lean is if you exercise. 
Okay. A smoker with high blood pressure, high cholesterol, who exercises, lives longer than the man who has none of these problems but doesn't exercise. Now, I didn't say go smoking. <laughs> but it's true. Exercise decreases the risk of a lot of these problems. For overweight people, exercise helps to handle you're going down in weight and then you plateau. You have to increase the BMR, so you have to exercise more. Actually, the waist circumference is probably better than the BMI, body mass index. Waist circumference. You'll lose inches around your waist before you lose weight. So, so that's important, this inches around the waist. You see, a person says, oh, I exercise. That's why my BMI is so high. So, so you get into the doctor's office, he measures you around here. And if you're big around here, you're not, that's overweight. See, it's easy to tell if you're overweight. <clears throat> you get on the scales. If the needle goes out of sight, you're too fat. <laughs> You lay down on the floor, you put a board between your chest and abdomen. If it goes up towards the abdomen, you're too fat. Or if you pinch here between the hip and the rib cage, if it's more than an inch, you're too fat. Okay? I used to say, put your tape measure right around the belly button. I don't do that anymore. I saw men walking down the streets with a belly button hanging down here. <laughs> You put that tape measure around halfway between the rib cage and the hip bone. <laughs> okay. When you lose weight, you're eating less calories. So you're going to lose muscle. So what you have to do is exercise so you lose less muscle. It has higher metabolic activity than the fat. Now, in my weight control programs, the women always get together and say, let's challenge the men. <laughs> now, that's a mistake. Because <laughs> the women's fat goes into estrogen, you know, goes into fat. Whereas the men's is testosterone. Exactly. See, with higher metabolic activity, they can get along fine on 2,000 calories and lose weight, and the woman has to go down to 1,000. A Russian study showed if you do an exercise that uses all the muscles, it's better than just some muscles. Like bicycling, you do the legs until you get down to where your uh, BMI should be. But then you stop doing it and you use robo. Use it goes up again for, for a while before it comes down. Uh, Now I want to give you the bad news. Excess exercises increases mortality just as much as inactivity. I hate to say that to anybody because hardly anybody's doing that. <laughs> you see? But it's true. Now they're trying to find out how much exercise it takes to be too much. And the difference between too much and the right amount is not very far. They did one study to show walking more than 10 miles a day, every day, is too much. It's just like not doing any exercise. Running five miles every day is too much. It's like doing no exercise. You die sooner. But I, I say I hate to tell you that because there's very few people doing that. Okay, now the next thing I want to talk to you about is the fat in the diet. I'm trying to get out some good uh, 
nice, beautiful handouts. This one's World Nutrition Guidelines, vegetarian basis. I have another one. Uh, what is a medical evangelist? By the way, when we do evangelism for the large cities, it says the minister is not adequate for the task. You're supposed to have a medical evangelist. That means a man who's trained like a doctor, but he's in the public sphere educating people. See? Then he comes back and works in the sanitarium, which today we would call live-in lifestyle center. He's not using medications. He's telling the people how to live so you don't get sick. It's public health. We were to be public health doctors. They called them medical evangelists in those days. But people were surprised. I went to Dick Hart, head of Loma University. And I said, the minister is not adequate to the task for evangelizing the city. Because it says the ministers are not adequate to the task. You need medical medicine. He says, is that in your thing? Yes, he says, it is. That's what Spirit of Prophecy says. <laughs> uh, but fats. Let's talk about fats. Let's look at this sheet. So you don't talk about, do use any bad words like vegetarian diet or meat. You just say, keep your saturated fat down to no more than 5 to 6% of the calories. That's the heart association recommendation. OK? Now, the red is the saturated fat. The longer the line, the more saturated fat there is. Now, what has the longest line? Coconut. Oh, I thought that was a health food. Gary Fraser tells me in the South Island, South Pacific Islands, those that have the most coconuts have more heart disease. I have in Granite Bay Church a lot of Fijian ladies, most of them pretty big. I said, do you have diabetes, heart attack? Yes, a lot of it. All they use is coconut oil. Just use it occasionally, cooking your rice, coconut milk. I don't mind that. But if that's the only oil you have to use, that's what you're using all the time. It's not too good. What's the next one? Butter. <coughs> milk has butter in it. Butter fats in milk. That's why the Heart Association says, if you're going to use milk, use only 1% fat, milk, or less, or none, see? Do you know Ellen White told us not to use butter? Did you know that? And here the Heart Association is saying the same thing. Palm oil. We don't grow palm nuts here, over in Malaysia. But they ship it here. You go to the store, you'll see there's some in a lot of the labels. But it's not a lot. Lard, and I might as well put beef there too. Lard is high in saturated fat. Okay. Cottonseed oil, they don't sell it overseas, but they do here. We have to educate people not to use it. But from peanut oil up, it doesn't matter. You have so little saturated fat. Chinese like to cook with peanut oil, OK? Uh, so it's not too bad. If I didn't know it was the best, I would probably pick canola oil. Canada oil, canola, they call it. Canada oil. That even has 11% alpha-linolenic acid, which is good. So the, the red ones, the last five or six, skip them. Don't use those kind. But now the yellow line, that's oleic acid, monounsaturated fatty acid. We used to say it had nothing to do with the cholesterol level. Now we know it does. Avocado is one of the best. It has a lot of it. In fact, I had it for lunch. <laughs> avocado. Uh, and I have one sheet here on avocado. Avocado's effect on blood cholesterol level. You, you don't just add avocado to the meal. You substitute it for another fat. That's not so good. Avocado is very good. Okay. 
Uh, <clears throat> now, there's two fatty acids you have to have in your diet. You have to have linoleic acid, and you have to have alpha linolenic acid. So omega-6 and omega-3. Now, what's omega-6 and omega-3 talking about? Well, I'll, I'll write some little formula up here. If you have three carbons in a row, and then a double bond, and then it changes the direction, that's an omega-3. If it has six carbons in a row, change the direction, that's omega-6. Okay. When you hydrogenate, uh, you knock out some of these double bonds, or you change them in location. Location, so that's not good. You can form trans fatty acids. It's bad. <clears throat> so we need these two now. The the blue line is easily obtained. You get that from many, almost any plant oil. It's so good at lowering your cholesterol that the Heart Association recommends up to 10% of your calories from that fat. But the alpha linolenic acid, the green one, is an omega-3. It's hard to find. Chia seeds have it. Flaxseed has it. But if you don't grind up the flaxseed, it'll go right through you. You won't, you won't ever see any of the oil. But it, so grind it up before you put it on your breakfast cereal. Uh, but that's what you need to know about the fats. And then I have it written out here to exactly how much fat. Now, I have the avocado sheet here. Now, this last sheet. Well, before we get to the last sheet, we have about 24 million Americans taking statins. They did life expectancy studies on those who took the statins and those who didn't. 93% of the people who take the statins don't live any longer than those who don't take the statins. Seven percent uh, who take the statins live eight and a quarter years longer, something like that. It does do them so good. They're the group that already has heart disease. We've been going by cholesterol level, and it's not a very good indicator who has heart disease and who doesn't. So I asked my cardiologist, a good fellow, and he said, uh, we just think maybe some of those have high cholesterol, may have heart disease, maybe. They don't know. So they're giving medicines to a lot of people who don't have heart disease. We need a better test. We, we need some things done nutritionally. In medical school, you don't have a good course usually in nutrition. We need a good course in medical school on nutrition, OK? Secondly, there are many of these, well, we don't know how to tell if you have heart disease for sure or not. They wanted to send me to San Francisco to do a test, cost $980. Insurance company won't pay for it. <laughs> no, nobody's gonna pay for it. So that's not practical. We need to find a better test. Uh, the other problem is, so oftentimes, doctors are working in groups, 20 people in a group. And the head man who organizes it all calls a meeting of all the doctors and says, now look, we've got to make some money on this. Only way to do it is say, see a new patient every 10 minutes. <laughs> and that's not going to work. You don't have time in 10 minutes to get anybody persuaded to do anything. Mm -hmm. So we have medical problems that need to be handled on this. Uh, but here I gave you the reference is for that 93% and 7% in this other sheet. Uh, now, do you need some fat in your diet? There are people promoting no fat. I don't think they're Christians. Have you read Leviticus too? 
the oil chapter, 16 verses. Oil is mentioned nine times in making your cornmeal for the bread. Now, if you don't put it in the mix, when the bread loaf is done, I think it's the third or fourth verse, says, paint it on top at least. <laughs> You're supposed to have the oil. It represents the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, I think I have one other sheet with lots of things, but I can put them on the blackboard here, the whiteboard. <laughs> Now your cholesterol, made up of three kinds. HDL, we used to think that was good. Exercise will bring it up. We want it high. But now, from a big study in Canada, about a big study, a Chinese doctor up there did it, we don't think HDL has much to do with the cholesterol story, heart disease story. The one who really pushed this was Bill Costelli. Bill Costelli, a Catholic gentleman, friend of mine. He took his course in Belgium, came to the US, and for 15 years he was director of the Framingham study. He's a real nice fellow. He's a good speaker. Everybody likes to hear him talk. <laughs> and he and I have lectured together, he in one room and me in another, 100 in each room. And at the break, we changed audiences. I, I know him quite well. I called him up the other day. I said, Dr. Costelli, my, my HDL is low. He said, are you still a vegetarian? I said, yes. Stick to it, he said. Stick to it. <laughs> we don't think HDL is as important as he thought it was in those days. OK? So the LDL is the main problem for the men. Low density lipoprotein cholesterol. Then there's the VLDL, very low density lipoprotein cholesterol. We don't measure those anymore. We take your triglycerides, that's the $25 word for fat in the bug, and divide it by five, that tells you how much cholesterol there is in the VLDL. The LDL has two kinds, sizes. The one is large, light bouillon type. If you have much of this, you have twice the risk of a heart attack. But if you have the small, dense type, like the diabetic has, you have seven times the risk of a heart attack. So when you go in to see your doctor, how's my cholesterol, doc? Oh, you're OK. Don't worry about it. That's not enough. You want to know the number. <laughs> you want to know the number. And you want to know what your triglyceride is. This is what men die from. <clears throat> but the triglyceride is a glycerol molecule with three fatty acids on it. Uh, if this is up to the no normal but top of normal, 90% of your LDL cholesterol are going to be the small, dense type, like the diabetic has, much higher risk. I was overseas, and the doctor was translating for me. He had never heard of that before. A lot of doctors haven't heard of it. But if you get this down to 60 to 80 US numbers, 90% of your LDL is the large, light, buoyant type, less dangerous type. So you need to know what the triglyceride is. That's what women die from. When that goes up high, that's usually an overweight problem. <laughs> so these are the two numbers you need to know, LDL, cholesterol, and triglyceride. OK? Any questions so far? You got all this? Understand it? Yeah. Uh, uh, my question is, so when it comes to ingesting, uh, eating stuff like omega-3s, do you have to 
pair it with something so that it can have its benefit? Like I know you have to pair tryptophan with a carb carbohydrate, so I'm wondering, uh, I'm wondering if omega-3. I have another sheet here at the back. The minimum amount of fat needed is dependent on about five or six things. You have to have enough fat to get the essential fatty acids. Okay? That's those two I mentioned. Linoleic acid and alpha linolenic acid. But that you can get very easily in small numbers. It doesn't take much. Next one. The amount of fat needed for absorption of the fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, K, carotenoids, that's easily had. Okay? For example, there's a number of papers came out that said if you don't put any fat on your salad dressing, you cannot absorb very much of the beta carotene. Mm. Mm. Now, I use my telephone a lot. So I called up the lady who had her name on that paper. She says, you know, it's not a convenient time right now. <laughs> well, when's a convenient time to call you? She gave me a time, so I called her back. It still wasn't very convenient. <laughs> because I was asking her, if you take carrot juice, no fat there, and you get keratinemia, that beta carotene's been well absorbed. <laughs> I said, how does that fit? She didn't have the least answer for that. So you have to question some of these things. Now, there's the long chain fat, uh, fat things that you have to have. EPA and DHA. Now, what's EPA? EPA, epi. EPA. Epi. Uh, and this is a, and it, it starts like this. Three carbons in a row, comes to a double bond, three carbons back, double bond, three carbons back, double bond, what I got? Let's see, how many I have that? Three, six, nine, twelve, more than that. So you have got to go back again. And then once more, and you have five at the bottom. C, O, that's three carbons, five carbons here. That's 20 carbons in a row. Or C O O H. So, epi, penta, it's, it's five of these, it's 20 here, 20 carbons, five of the double bonds. Now that you have to have fish for. I don't want to eat fish. That's for the kidney and the brains, developing brains and uh, nerves for the baby. They even put some of the EPA into uh, baby milk, milk substitutes. Uh, doctor, who's head of our studies in the Loma Linda, the Adventist, Dr. Fraser, he got six girls all vegans, didn't use any animal product. He takes a needle, sticks it into the buttocks, pulls out a fat globule, and has it measured. They had more EPA than the regular population, yet they never had fish or any animal product. So we don't know how they're getting it. Maybe some unusual soy product? We don't know. <laughs> but it's exciting. So you don't have to have this as a vegetarian. They are putting it in, in, in cow's milk for infants, uh, but the people from the Food and Drug Administration thinks it might be harmful. They aren't sure. So the DHA has uh, even more carbons. Then the things that are important here, I think, is the particle size get your triglycerides down, 
So these don't be the small dense type. Second thing, how, how can you prevent excessive triglyceride going up in the blood? If you have 50 grams of triglyceride, you better sp spread that fat over uh, that fat over two meals, not just one. With 15 grams, it doesn't raise your clotty thing, stickiness of the red cell. With 15 grams, but from there on, it begins to increase the coagulability, the clotting, the red blood cell. Okay. Now let's see. Oh, here's what I was looking for. Any questions about this on the fat? Yes. Um, you mentioned the fat-soluble vitamins. Yes. And they say if you don't get your salad, you don't absorb it. The cholesterol is floating loose in your blood, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's in your blood, right? It flows in your blood? Cholesterol, so you yes. you have the fat in your blood, you wouldn't need to take it in, would well, you? The cholesterol is not a fat. Hmm? Oh, okay. You see, you have to know the difference between lipids and cholesterol. Okay. Lipids is cholesterol. It's triglyceride, that's fat. And it's uh, wax. We don't have wax in the body, so we'll forget that one. But cholesterol is more like an alcohol. This one here. And there's these three kinds, you see. But that's, but the doctors oftentimes interchange these two words, and they shouldn't, technically. Lipids has to do with fats and cholesterol, and that's separate from cholesterol itself. So are those just stored in the cells in the body? They're not, I'm just wondering about the vitamins in your blood. Is there a way for them to be absorbed if you're not taking in the oil in the salad? Well, think for cholesterol in the brain. The brain cell makes cholesterol. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So to get the uh, vitamins, the A, D, E, and K, yeah. and the chloride uh, absorbed, is there naturally occurring things in your body just through your diet that will? It's the fat in the diet. Okay. It takes care of that. So you actually have to take in the fat with those vitamins, or is what about fat you've already consumed? Is it available to, to grab? Yeah, that? yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. I don't think you have to worry about that too yeah, much. Yeah, I don't have to worry about that at all. Yeah. Okay. I've got plenty. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to ask about fat and diabetes. What is the association? I'm not hearing her. Oh. <laughs> fat and diabetes. This, the association between fat and diabetes. Yes. And I refer to the fat not remember on your those, body. Remember the lifestyle factors I told you about? That lowers diabetes risk 88%. Oh, there you go. See, now here's our problem. When the doctor sees a lady who's overweight, writes a prescription, you will now exercise an hour every day. She comes back one month later a little heavier than she was. <laughs> Did you exercise? No. After he's seen a thousand such women, he stops telling them to exercise. That's a problem. We have a hard time. The ne next big breakthrough we're going to have in health is learning how to get people to do what we know they ought to do. <laughs> we, we don't know how to do that. That's our problem. We know what to tell them. We know what will help them. But they aren't going to do it. So, so that's our big problem. We don't know how to do that. We know what they should do. I'm referring to the fat that you pour on your salad dressing in that uh, liquid uh, fat, like olive oil, canola oil. Yeah, well, the papers came out saying that you're going to decrease your absorption of the beta carotene if you don't have full fat salad dressing. Mm -hmm. And I questioned it because when you drink, Carrot juice without any fat, you get yellow skin. <laughs> You're absorbing it pretty well. <laughs> so I call these people up and ask them, but it's not convenient to talk to them. Practically <laughs> saying, it's better to get the juice than to 
have salad with the dressing. To get, get which juice? So you're practically saying it's better to have the carrot juice than to have the salad with the fats. Nutritionists recommend no juices. Right. We used to recommend taking juices. We don't anymore. We recommend no juices. For example, orange juice increases your diabetes risk, but a whole orange decreases it. Okay? There's some fiber in it. Yeah. What's, what's that? What is one of the healthiest foods you could just eat overall? What foods overall? Broccoli. <laughs> vegetarian diet. Like one, like certain food? What's that? Like a vegan or vegetarian? Vegan, uh, vegan or vegetarian? Well, oh. vegan is, t I don't use the term vegan. Let me explain why. Uh, is it plant based diet? In, England, the man who started the term vegan, there was nothing religious about it, no religious connotation. But when the man in the U.S. started, Jay Dinshaw, a friend of mine, I know him well, state of Israel, home. When he started it, he named his monthly paper for vegans a hymnshaw. Do you know what a hymnshaw is? I won't use any food making money off the animal. I won't use silkworms silk. I won't use leather, because I'm making money off the animal. See? So the nutritionists in this country said we will have a new term, a food vegan. He's only food vegan. <laughs> in other words, he's only talking about food, not talking about leather or silk. But as a Christian, you still have another problem. Honey, eat honey is good, Proverbs said. A vegan can't do that, according to the Hindus, the Baha'i. And the Baha'i says you should eat supper way before sundown, because after sundown, more of God's insects might be flying around here. You might kill some. <laughs> uh, OK? Yeah, question. Uh, concerning the dietary fats, I see that she, even though canola, sunflower, uh, sunflower, corn, and soybean, they are lower in saturated fats, those oils are very much too processed. They are even the oils that are found in most processed foods because they are extracted okay. to solvents. I believe they are highly inflammatory. Uh, I would think that the best bets are olive oil, avocado oils, even though those oils are considered very low in saturated fats, I don't think they are healthy. Okay, let me tell you about uh, the top one there, canola. Canola oil had a, a fatty acid that tended to increase heart attack risk. So they grew a whole lot of it, a big piece of land, and picked those that had the least amount, did that in a whole lot of it, and gradually they managed to get that fatty acid out. So that's not there anymore. That was the main reason that canola had a bad reputation to start with, but it doesn't anymore. We don't see any problem with it now. Okay. Any other question? Yes. Um, years ago, I was taught to, if you want to drink uh, a fruit juice, to mix it half with water so it wouldn't spike your insulin. <laughs> now the nutritionists say, don't use fruit juice at all. Mm -hmm. Like orange juice increases diabetes risk, but orange decreases it. So they're saying don't use fruit juice at all. John, yeah. what about oxidized cholesterol? OK. If you take monkeys and try to produce atherosclerosis, 
you have a hard time doing it with the kind of atherosclerosis that we get. Your body makes cholesterol. We get enough. You don't have to have it in your diet. Your body makes enough. Okay. The kind you get from your food is oxidized. You can't produce uh, atherosclerosis very easily with monkeys using oxidized, unless you use oxidized cholesterol, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't need any cholesterol. But if you get it from eggs, the embryo is breathing through the egg shell even. So that's oxidized cholesterol that you will get from the food. And I want to make a reference to your, um, away from the fat and so forth, back to the exercise. You had mentioned that and not to walk more than five miles. I've got multiple every people day. that I know. That's that. every day. Yeah, well, I've got multiple, so multiple people that are, that are ultra milers, uh, marathoners, um, ultra marathoners. Um, do you, I wonder if you can reference that study that you had made. It's, it's Harvard, it's the Harvard uh, alumni study, is what it's called. Uh, Well, something else I was going to say about this. You know, it's the protein is a problem, too. One out of seven people in the United States has chronic kidney disease. The nephrologists are agreed that if everybody in previous years had less protein in their diet, we could decrease kidney disease death rate by 32%, which is quite a bit. Because kidney disease, once you got it, it's pretty late to try to reduce the risk of dying from it. So they're saying, from that standpoint, a vegetarian diet would be better, less protein in it. So that's an advantage. Yes? So as far as free fats that you added to your diet, like the olive oil, yes. how do we align that, um, and which we, we do use in our family, but how do we align that with Ellen White's statement of fruits and vegetables free of grease? So is that- You know what she meant by grease? That's what I'm wondering. She meant animal fat. Okay. That's what she meant by grease. But in the Spanish edition of the book, they didn't report it that way. But it means animal fat in her day. Any other qu qu question? I have a question. Yes. Okay. I have a question. If you're vegan and you are not using any cholesterol, higher cholesterol foods, but your cholesterol goes up, is that that your body is making its own cholesterol because it's necessary for our living? Your cholesterol can go up because of what your body does too. It can oxidize once it's in the body. So is that not as dangerous? No, the, the cholesterol that your body makes ordinarily is not the oxidized, but it can get oxidized afterwards. The one that's oxidized may still be dangerous. Yeah. But when we were trying to do atherosclerosis, develop atherosclerosis in monkeys, we had a difficult time doing it with pure cholesterol. We had to have oxidized cholesterol. And your body, the kind your body makes is pure cholesterol, not oxidized. But it can but it's change. It's elevated, but it's elevated. So you have a more than what is regular, you know, if it's 200 plus. Let me tell you something. Most of the studies done on mortality rate and cholesterol level were done on men, not women. They might have had 10 women in the group of 100, but all the rest were men. Okay. So they never did studies on women. I asked an Adventist doctor who's putting people on cholesterol in San Francisco. I said, do you treat women the same way? Yes. They think women are just like men. And I'm a doctor. I know there's a difference. <laughs> okay? 
<laughs> now, it, it's interesting. But when they did three studies just on women, two of the three showed up to 67% higher mortality rate on the people who took the statins. Mm -hmm. So I don't think women in general should be taking them. Well, then how about the men? They've decided that older men with higher levels do better than those with our so-called normal levels, good levels. So if you're 75 or older as a man, they're even recommending, no matter what your level is, don't go on, on the satins, which is kind of interesting. So I have a paper on promoting the idea of non-use of statins. I put together all these things that we know about it, and we don't know enough about it to say much about it. So I have a Hello? OK. So I have a question on uh, exercise. Uh, number 12, it says excess exercise increases mortality like inactivity does. So you know, I've read papers on uh, triathletes having a high incidence of uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, so how, I'm planning to run a marathon in the future. So, huh? Do a third of a marathon. Do a third, Do a third of a marathon. marathon. <laughs> so I, I think marathons are bad because we can check you afterwards and show it's damaged the muscles. Yeah, the immune system is, you know, shot after for for the next two weeks. I I heard or I've read. So, give me a balance. What, I know the recommendation is 30 minutes a day, five days a week. I know that, but what's what's extreme, what's excess, and what's... I know that... I've, I've also read that you should rest more than you exercise. So give me a, a sense of where you need to be, the balance where people need to be. I think exercising is fine. Exercising is worth more in mid-age. I quit my job at age 51 teaching nutrition, Loma Linda. I went up to North Fork, bought 26 acres of woods for $28,000. Backed into the National Forest, the stream runs the length of the place. It's nice, okay? I bought a Husqvarna chainsaw. And I wished the sun would stay up longer. I made a quarter of a mile road from the house down to civilization and uh, and, and uh, I exercise a lot. Practical and with Alzheimer's disease, there are studies that show it's mid middle age. Well, that's the time you eat more, exercise less, <laughs> which we shouldn't be doing. That's the time we need to do the exercise, mm -hmm. rather than just when you're young or just when you're old. something that we, sh as far as heating up the fats, and whether it's heating up just a little bit or frying, um, I assume frying is really bad with the fats, but what about any type okay. of heating? Okay, when you're heating fat, we don't hydrogenate in our kitchen. It takes a zinc or something in the pan to, to do that, and we don't have it. So in the kitchen, you are not hydrogenating. If you bring it up to the smoking point, you're probably making some carcinogenic agents. Yeah. So the, the frying in the, in, in the oil that you use the same oil over and over probably is not good. Yeah. Now there's a Czechoslovakian Adventist nutritionist. Everybody goes by what he says. And he says that uh, you should have, uh, what's he call it? Uh, the unrefined kind, uh, what do you, what's the? The trans. Uh, not, not the trans, but I'm trying to think of the word. No, I can't come to the mind right now. But anyway, he thinks the good olive oil, or virgin, Extra virgin. Extra virgin. Is, is good, see. Uh, it has a teeny bit more of the right kinds of fats. We have not enough more for any study to show it's doing any good. He thinks it does some good. I don't think so. So I don't worry about whether it's virgin oil or not. Yes. Dr. Uh, I'm not sure we asked 
Doctor, could you please comment on the significance of inflammation with regards to general health? And the reason I ask this is that uh, most of the alternative medicine community seems to believe that the way you encourage good health is basically to eat so you lower inflammation. That's correct. That's right. I think it's okay. Heart disease, we say, is inflammatory disease. So it's, it's inflammation is a problem. We want to avoid that. Yeah. Doctor, what would make a, a vegan, a vegan's LDH <coughs> elevated, and the triglycerides, the total cholesterol, the HDH, all of those are within normal limits. What would make the LDH high? LDH or L HDL? Which one? No, the L. LDL? Mm -hmm. What would make it higher? Yeah. Well, you know, it doesn't correlate that well with heart disease. That's a problem with it. That's our problem. We wish we had a better indicator. Calcium index might be better, uh, but we aren't. In other words, for 93%, the statins didn't do anybody any good in longevity even though they took the sentence. Doctor, here on this side. Do you have any facts about the grapeseed uh, oil, good or bad? Grapeseed oil. I didn't get it. I think she's talking about rapeseed oil. Rapeseed oil? Or, or grapeseed. Or, or grape. Grape. Grape seed is a good one. All right, well, uh, now let, let's talk a little bit about your health. Okay. Someone asked me after the... It means that during diastole, when it's resting, it doesn't expand long enough, big enough, to get enough blood in it. Even though the fraction that expels is good, there wasn't enough in it to start with. Diastolic dysfunction, they call it. Uh, so I have a little of that. When I was 80, I began to get a little high blood pressure. That's quite different than getting it when you're 50. Quite a bit different, okay? So I have some problems. Uh, the doctor asked me if I have had osteoporosis. I said, yes. I have some osteoporosis, but I haven't had a fracture since I was a childhood. I asked the doctor, what's my chance of getting a hip fracture this next year? 5%. 95% I won't get it. 95% is bigger than the 5%. <laughs> so I, I do have some problems, but really not bad for my age. <laughs> So uh, you also mentioned that uh, your your brothers and you have different longevity. Why why do you think your longevity is primarily different than your brothers? Same, we're, we same were always goal. vegetarian, all of us. That didn't make the difference. But I quit a job in the city, moved to the country, and worked like mad with a chainsaw, and they didn't get any of that. I think that made the big difference. And also, you worked outdoors, outdoors. in the sun. Yep. as well. Yep. So and now we're learning about infrared and preserving mitochondria. Right. A lot of that outdoor um, exercise is a key aspect. Yep. You, you didn't do much gym exercises then. No. <laughs> now it's outside. I've been trying to teach people without using Adventist terms, do useful exercise. <laughs> <laughs> do useful exercises. Yeah. And what's useful exercise? Gardening, 
And you did a lot of gardening. You yeah. had your own garden, yes. your own fruit trees. And it wasn't my wife things. doing it either. It was me doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Walking's good, but let me explain something. I had a Chinese-Australian couple, friends of ours, come over, and uh, I wanted to show them around where I lived, up and down. And I said, Are, can you do some up and down stuff? You know? Oh, yes, we have a tennis court in our yard. We play tennis every day. I was ahead with a husband and, and my wife was with a lady and the daughter. And I heard the daughter say to her mother, Mom, tell him you're pooped. This is no tennis court. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I do think the natural ground, walking, is quite different. Yeah, I think, uh, doesn't Ellen White say something about even physicians needing to uh, climb hills as far as exercise? Well, yes. They, had some land offered us in Modesto, flat. Don't take it, she says. We need the teachers to be going up and down hills. <laughs> One of the benefits of Weimar. You yes. can't really walk very far without going up and down hills. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, uh, <clears throat> go ahead. Oh, what about the intermittent exercise? That's down What's that? Down what about the intermittent exercise? Yeah, I, I think it's intermittent fasting is important. Okay. So I'm on two meals a day, so I in, do intermittent fasting every day. What I noticed, uh, you know, because I was invited to this too, after Chef AJ got all those hits, she invited me for a, her birthday party, yeah, I think right. it was, and it was in the evening, and she was surprised that when you came there, you refused to eat. In the evening. Fasting. So, uh, how long have you been doing that, that intermittent fasting without eating in the evening? I, I went on two meals a day because of what Ellen White said. I did that when the children got old enough to know what I was doing at supper time. Mm. I had to be on two meals a day or not teach them to do it. And I brought up my kids on intermittent fasting. Now, the scientists are saying the same thing today. There's a scientist uh, down in Alabama, somewhere down there, a, a dietitian, PhD. She's the one that started the idea of uh, eat, eat everything you're going to eat before 2 p.m. Yeah. And that's what Ellen White said. See, but most of us hadn't done it. At one time, in about... Uh, 1870, we had about 70,000 Adventists. Ellen White went to all the camp meetings. She said, I know they're all on two meals a day. Mm. At one time, we were. But we've lost that mu much. But it's coming back. A few people are beginning to move in that direction. I think it's very good for weight control. It's good for sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. It's good for metabolic uh, cycles not bouncing around too much. Uh, so there's other good things about it that even many people in the world have started talking about that now. So intermittent fasting, a key intermittent aspect. Fasting. All right, we're going to wrap things up here pretty soon, but uh, uh, maybe just a couple more questions. Uh, Another question, testimony. Or, or, or comment, yes, back here. She passed away 11 years ago, about two weeks before she turned 88. So you've been, you've been a bachelor. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. for, uh, for all those years. Yeah, she. Yeah. She had a pelvic fracture. Oh. All right, anything? Uh, go ahead. Would you mind sharing your meal? and your bedtimes and rise times? Well, I get up early. Mm -hmm. I'm up at 4 o'clock. My breakfast comes at 6.30. Lunch, 12.30 or 1. Yeah. Then no more. That's it. Don't eat any more after that. No. What time do you go to bed? Early. <laughs> <laughs> 8 or 9 o'clock, I'm in bed. 
All right, another key ingredient we're learning there. Yes. What do you eat for breakfast and your second meal? They want to know what, what you actually eat for breakfast and lunch. Uh, breakfast, I do good. Uh, breakfast, I have, give you lots of ideas on breakfast. It's so good. It should be the best meal of the day. I even have it sometimes twice a day. <laughs> <laughs> but you have cooked cereal. I like that the best. I like dry cereal. Uh, I like waffles. Not usual waffles. The kind my wife makes. Healthful waffles. Oatmeal. Two cups of oatmeal. Two cups of water. Two tablespoons of oil half a teaspoon of salt, then it'll be a white waffle. You want a brown waffle, so you put a little carbohydrate, half a banana, a little bit of applesauce, something like that. I mean, you get good waffles. Correct, yeah. very good. And for lunch? For lunch, is a little harder. I was eating out, and the two ladies who are taking care of me are treating me like a little boy. <laughs> They didn't like to see me eating out. So the one sister brings me lunch every day, which is pretty good. <laughs> uh, what is it usually? What's that? What, what do they bring usually? What kind of food? Oh, the last time one I had was stuffed green pepper with rice and gluten in it. Oh. I had that. Sweet potato. Uh, I don't remember what all, but it's all good stuff that they bring. <laughs> Yeah, they have a whole box of uh, ground up flaxseed wow. to put on my breakfast cereal every morning. Wow. He did tell me this, his son is a physician and did a full evaluation of him recently. And your son told you his estimate on how long you were gonna live, you wanna tell them? Yeah, he thought I'd live to be 110. Ah, interesting. But I, it's, All right, All right, one more question here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Schoenberg. Um, since we've kind of delved into nutrition and now digestion, um, as a gastroenterologist, I was wondering if you had any comments or any literature about prebiotics, probiotics, and fiber. Oh, I like probiotics. They're wondering, wondering what you recommend on the gut microbiome, prebiotics. I, I think probiotics. we need a lot more research. I think there's real potential here, but I think we need more research before I say anything much about it, okay? Uh, now, I want to talk to you about too much water. I hate to say that because not many people are doing it, but there was a man who didn't do a marathon. He wanted to try one. He heard it was going to be sunny that day, so he drank about a gallon of water before he went out. And every time they handed him water, he drank more. At the 16 mile post, he could hardly move. He walked. He got diarrhea. He was in bad shape. But he managed to cross the end point and he went to the first aid. And because he could walk in, they said he's okay. So he goes back to his apartment high up, and uh, he thought he was feeling bad. He thought he'd better drink more water. So he drank more water. And then suddenly, he jumped up in the air and crashed in a coma. The air lifted him to the hospital. They thought he must be dehydrated, so they gave him <laughs> IV saline. When he got to the hospital, he found he had a low sodium level. Yeah, he you see, that makes Absorption. the brain swell. Mm -hmm. And so he was in coma four days. He doesn't do, but he doesn't do these marathons anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's quite in interesting. And I had my secretary from TV unit email me one day. She said, my blood sodium is low. How many potato chips should I eat? <laughs> I said, it's not a matter of potato chips. It's a matter of cutting down your water, liquid. How much do you use? Well, she says, I eat, you drink about 10 glasses a day, 
plus, of course, my coffee and tea and my cola drinks. <laughs> and so she cut down her liquid, and her blood sodium was OK the next time. I got sick. I knew I should drink water. I drank only nine cups. My blood sodium was low. I'd had one ordered for me before I was ill, and I went and had it done, and it was a point lower than it should be. All right. Uh, one final question here in the front. What do you think about supplements? Or about supplements? Supplements, yeah. vitamins. Well, you know, we have a National Institutes of Health section on supplements. Ah. You know what they recommend? Don't use them. <laughs> for, for example, we thought beta carotene was so good. They thought these smokers should get it. They gave it to them, increased the risk of, of uh, lung cancer, and they died sooner. And they are afraid that these supplements we don't know enough about. We haven't done enough study. They said, don't take them to try to reduce cancer risk. That's what they're saying. Not even vitamin C, though? Uh, vitamin C would be safest. You know, we take a lot of it, and most of it is excreted. That's why we have the healthiest toilets in the world. <laughs> How about B12? <laughs> B12 gets excreted pretty fast, too. Right. Exactly. But one thing you should know, if you're a total vegetarian, you need to take B12. Right. Okay, you need to know that. And then you need to think about, are you getting enough calcium also? Also, B3. See, now there's three ways to get your calcium naturally. OK? You, you get uh, salt. Cut your salt intake in half. That controls the excretion uh, of the calcium from the kidneys and the reabsorption. It's like taking 900 milligram tablet of calcium every day if you cut your salt intake in half. Second thing you do is make sure your d vitamin D blood levels are good, because yes. that has to do with the absorption of the D. If you have adequate levels, you will absorb two to three times more calcium than you would otherwise. Right. The third thing is don't count the calcium in the foods that have a lot of oxalic acid or phytic acid, because it forms an insoluble salt that you can't absorb. Mm -hmm. How about turmeric, though? Mm -hmm. Well, there's, uh, there's still a lot more people wanting to ask questions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just have so, a comment. OK, comment. I just ahead. wanted to thank you for, for yeah. sharing here today. Um, <laughs> as, a, as a chef, and I've been learning to be a vegan chef, right. I, have, uh, I have a lot of questions. I'd like to pick, mm -hmm. pick your brain forever, but I'm sure you have a lot of written work that I could look up to. So I just wanted to thank you for that. So I appreciate yeah. it. But these simple things like getting more calcium, I think are important. Our people could know what to do. Take the iron. What about coffee? One cup of tea decreases iron absorption compared to one cup of water by 60%. A cup of uh, coffee decreases it by 50%. A cup of milk, because of the, of the calcium in it, decreases it 50%. So we need to know simple little things that we can do to help someone. I had a lady in Bangladesh. She had lost four babies. She was pregnant now again, afraid she was going to lose her baby. What should I do? I said, stop drinking your English tea. They're all tea drinkers over there. She, and that would be like t taking a calcium tablet. All right, two more burning ones here. How old is your son, and what health is he in? She, she wants to know about the health of your physician's son. Is, is he in good health? He's in good health. He, he's too fat. <laughs> How old is he? How he's, old are you? He's about 74. Oh, 74. But he needs to get down on his weight. But otherwise, he's doing well. Caffeinated or de uh, well, is it, does, does that include decaffeinated tea? 
when you said about cutting back on tea, you're talking about caffeinated tea, right? Not herbal tea? Uh, English tea, yeah. Yeah, it's the caffeinated tea. Now, I, I was in the Czech Republic the other day, and I was in this town where they had two universities. One was a public health university. I spoke at both the same day, and I was tipped off that in the public health university, there was a man going to ask me about coffee. So I was ready for him. <laughs> he was very pleasant. I said, there's three reasons that you shouldn't drink coffee. The first reason is, the people, or, or first reason is, no medical organization recommends coffee for anything. Second reason is, the group that lives the longest doesn't drink coffee and recommends people not do it, Adventist vegetarian. And the third reason is, everybody agrees with this, that during pregnancy, women should not take any drug that includes coffee. I can give you a lot of other reasons. There's another reason. One cup of coffee compared to a cup of water increases the nitrates converted to nitrosamines, carcinogenic substances, tenfold. That's another reason. In regards to coconut milk, coconut butter, does that increase cholesterol? If you're eating it every day. If you're on an island where all they have is coconut oil, like Fiji, there's more heart attacks, more diabetes. Oh. See? But if you only want to use coconut milk, milk to cook your rice someday to make it taste quite different, do it. It's not going to worry about one, one time. Do you have the microphone? Yeah. Going to, back to olive oil, my usual salad dressing is olive oil and a little squeeze of lemon. But I also like olive oil on other parts of my food. How much is too much? How much olive oil is too much olive oil? Uh, I don't think you're going to worry about getting too much olive oil. But uh, olive oil is OK. Avocado is OK. That's the yellow line on that chart. So that's good. And you see what the avocados did. They did real well. Unless it increases your BMI, right? That's right. Nine grams per. Yeah, you don't want to get too fat. Nine calories per gram. Yeah. Comment on tofu. We hear good and bad on tofu. All right, what about soy and tofu? OK. I had a lot of people talk about that in my lecture on January 26. <clears throat> tofu is good. We used to worry about breast cancer in women. So they went to Japan and China, checked all the women who had breast cancer in one breast, checked their diets, and waited to see who got breast cancer in the other breast. The ones who ate the most tofu had the least recurrence. So they stopped worrying about the estrogenic effect of tofu. It's so small compared to what an OBGYN person will give a woman a prescription for tofu. So small. What about men and their breasts and tofu? Uh, you know, we try to raise chickens and get them fatter. So they put estrogen in the pellets in the neck of the chicken. Now, if you ate the neck of the chicken without pellet, yeah, you'd get too much estrogen. But otherwise, you wouldn't. So I'm not. I, tofu, I think, is a better food than most of us think. I would recommend 100 grams, one quarter of those boxes, every day. Now, see, we aren't using the tofu like they do in Japan. They don't get breast cancer over there. Another thing you've got to think about, you ladies, this breast cancer problem. Alcohol is a problem, increasing breast cancer risk. Okay? Lack of iodine is a problem. 
people don't realize that the breast has a cabbage on the iodine just like the thyroid does. We just think only thyroid. But the breast does too. And so if people get fibrotic fibroid things in their breast, they're treating it with iodine. Where do we get iodine? Well, we can get it in milk. You know why? Because the, milk, the cow's teats are scrubbed clean with an iodine solution. <laughs> 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 but iodine is in the salt. If you're not using any salt, then you're not going to get much. Okay. A last question on, on tofu. Have you heard um, correlation between too much tofu and reducing your testosterone levels for men? You're doing what? Will, will too much uh, tofu cause your testosterone to go down? No, I don't think you're going to have. I don't think you're going to have any problem with that. Yeah, not not the usual amounts. It would take huge, no. huge amounts to do that. Well, uh, Dr. Scharfenberg, it's been great to have you here at Weimar University, and uh, uh, we would like to invite you back. You're, you're an encyclopedia. <laughs> of, uh, of all sorts of nutrition and other information. And uh, we just want to uh, praise the Lord for your long and productive life and the positive impact you've had on many. And I know you're going to have a greater impact even as you continue to live and, and preach uh, yeah. Christ's message of health and health reform uh, to the world. Any final sentence or two? For Weimar. I'm excited about <coughs> teaching our children, Amen. getting them prepared for the last days. I, I'm really excited about that. Amen. <coughs> let's, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for giving us life and giving it abundantly. Amen. We thank you for the health that you've given Dr. Scharfenberg and also the mind to be able to uh, remind us in the messages you gave your servant. And as he has mentioned today, the more he lives, the more he realizes the, uh, the, the great confidence that we can have in your prophets. Believe your prophets, so shall you be established. And so we pray that we might trust more in you and in the messages you've given us through your prophets. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'd like to mention in the Philippines, I took students into a little island there. <clears throat> Today, 60% of the islanders are Seventh-day Adventists. That's what the health message did. Polilio, next to Kazan. We taught gardening. The kids were eight to 10 inches too short. I got pictures of all this. And uh, they should have been taller. We had to teach gardening. The governor of the province made a rule all schools must teach gardening <laughs> because of what we did. Amen. So uh, a tour for, for those interested in the tour, and an updated tour of Weimar will be 10 minutes from now. Uh, right here uh, at Haskell Hall. Dr. Martin, do you want to stand up? Dr. Martin is going to be uh, starting out your tour. You'll have two tour guides, and he'll uh, do the first part of the tour, and then um, uh, we'll have a second part of the tour. Where does the second part begin, Erica? Yeah, they'll be following Dr. Martin before you get to the second part. So uh, it can start here in 10 minutes. Thank you.